Okay, I'm also gonna do my video. Saying hi to just going to say hi to everyone. Um, yeah. Okay. Is everything okay on your side? Can you see everything? Yes. Yeah. No, everything is okay. I think if you can put them on uh, slide. No? Slide. Yeah. Okay. And then I'll just quickly do the introductions. Um, sure. Then, then we'll then facilitate. So, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Center for Civil Society. Um, really exciting uh, that uh, you have joined us today. Uh, this is the second part of the research that was conducted and we're looking at shrinking civic spaces uh, in South Africa. And today we're looking at equal Section 27 and equal education. And our presenter is one of our own, Visa Katabula, and I'll just give a quick uh, background about Visa Katabula. she's currently the Global Funds Head uh, of community rights and gender at, at the gender and gender department. She is the former African advocacy and partnerships at the Stephen Lewis Foundation. She is the former director of the African Center for HIV and AIDS Management at Stellenbosch University. She has been living openly with HIV for more than two decades and has been a leader in the people living with HIV movement throughout this time. Uh, Vuisaka was executive director of the Treatment Action Campaign from 2007 until 2013. She is currently a commissioner on the O'Neill Lancet Global Commission on Racism, Structural Discrimination and Global Health for 2022 until 2025 period. She has served on the South African National AIDS Council and was a founder of the Activist Center for Education and Development in 2009. Wisaka, welcome to the Center for Social Society. Uh, you are no stranger. We've been working with you for quite some time. I'll hand over to Dan. Dan will be facilitating today's session. Thank you, Andres, for this introduction. Uh, thank you, Vuisega, for making time. I know you, there is a pressure uh, of time on your side. Um, I just want to apologize for, you know, last week, uh, uh, you know, mix up with the times. Uh, sometimes I forget that we are in different time zones. So uh, thank you for, for just making time. Um, I'm just going to give you 30 minutes to share, you know, some of the findings, you know, some of the key findings um, in, you know, the case studies that you, you did section 27 and the equal education. And then we're just going to have maybe a, section, a, a session on uh, uh, the questions and, and, and answers. And so we have to respond to a couple of questions from, from, yeah. from the audience. So uh, thanks again for, for making time for Isera. If you can uh, begin, uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so I'm just going to go straight to the presentation to save some time maybe for discussion and conversation at the end. So mine today is, as um, Andres has said, I'm going to share the findings of the research that I did on the four case studies, but today I'm focusing on section 27 and equal, equal education. The way I'm doing the presentation today, because I'm doing two case studies, I also looked at the similarities and areas of divergence in the case studies, but each case study is unique um, in its own way because these organizations are very different in the way that they're operating. But the also interesting thing with Equal Education and Section 27, there's an intersection in their work around um, the quality of education and, uh, and the right to education, quality education for public um, schools, particularly for poor kids. So that's also an interesting intersection between these two case studies. They are very different, um, and I'll share with you in detail. For example, Section 27 is an NGO, typically a human rights organization, um, but equal education is a, fundamentally a, identifies as a movement of young people. So this, they are very different in, in many ways, but they're working on similar, on similar things. So I'm going to share a bit of the background on the methods, I want to spend a bit of time on the findings. So I'll, I'll rush through the background because I assume that some of us are aware why civic space is important. When we are talking about shrinking civic space, what could be the our, our anxieties and challenges when we hear of shrinking civic space in South Africa in the South African context? So firstly, 
many scholars define civic space as many things. And one of the things that I also grappled with in the, in the study is that often activists do not call the space that they're operating in civic space. So I had to explain a bit what civic space is and make it very accessible in language, uh, just saying where you are participating, where you are engaging, where you are influencing policy, just to make the language easier because for them to identify with civic space was the first thing that I had to unpack uh, in vernacular. But scholars say civic space is, is one of the basic foundations where civil society can contribute to society, particularly to achieve social justice for civil society. But there are a set of conditions that allow civil society to, to contribute uh, in, in that space. And, and that those set of conditions allow, facilitate, enables uh, civil society to also contribute and influence those structures. And because of those set of conditions that allow civil society to participate, you can say a space is open or closed if those conditions are, are not enabling civil society to participate. If they're not enabling that, you often we say they are shrinking, shifting, narrowing, or closing down. So because we look at those conditions that allow civil society to contribute. But also we know that civic space is not a, a space where it, there are no contestations. There are dominant interests in the civic space. The state is a big player in the civic space. The people themselves, the public is a big player, private sector, big player. So there are multiple interests in the civic space that obviously there will be contestation for that space to either close down for certain groups who are seen as an undesirable, or making too much noise on certain things. But at the same time, if that space is not contested, that could also be problematic because you politically also having monolithic views where we all agree or we all subscribe to one homogeneous view and narrative and interest that also it could indicate problems. But at the same time, when the state opens up space, but then the space does not people don't contribute or influence policies, it could also be a problem. So that contestation means that it's a healthy tension that allows the state, particularly in this case, and I will be referring a lot to the state because one of the definitions is that who are we saying is shrinking civic, civic, civic space because we also have to say in the civic space there are multiple players and who is the big player who has power to close that space and how is that experienced in South Africa. Uh, the importance of civic space for civil society is one, civil society is a space for the poor, the, for the marginalized, the vulnerable communities to have a, a place where they can formulate, organize their power, collectively challenge, or even collectively form some form of solidarity to contest their power within the civic space through alliances or strategic um, alliances amongst themselves the civil society. And often that is the first or the last line of defense for the poor, especially when there is a decay in what people call it trust to government. If that there is no trust to government, often civil society or people trust civil society to be their voice and be their first in line of defense. Also, civil society plays a critical role in challenging abuse of power, not just by the state, but also by private sector, in ensuring that that power does not step on people's power, people meaning poor people who are marginalized uh, and in, who are left out of making decisions in the big scheme of things, or even you know, distribution of resources or service delivery. Where the state does not deliver, civil society often is the first a line for poor communities to be able to challenge state power where it does not, um, uh, that power is not used uh, constructively to deliver services. But also civil society holds government accountable where the state has decided on policies and adopts certain policies pushed by civil society to achieve social justice or fairness or human rights or just society the same civil society will hold government accountable 
And sometimes it's not just civil society that holding government, it's the people themselves together. And that accountability is not just through the in between elections and elections. So elections are part and parcel of holding government accountable, meaning we will give you another five years if you deliver certain things to us. And when you do not deliver, we'll hold you accountable using our mechanisms of self-organizing ourselves to challenge you, but also raise awareness where government is falling short, ensuring that government delivers on what it had promised to deliver. So is it true that civil society in South Africa is shrinking? And I use the, 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 the idea of breath and as something that is so important because without open civic space, civic civics, the people, civil society will not try to a point of suffocation. That is when we can say the space is shrinking. When civil society has no breathing space, has no ability, not capable, does not have resources and space to challenge the state, that civil society will die. So in defining civic space, scholars are saying it refers to threats when you are speaking up, when you are holding government accountable, you are threatened, intimidated, stigmatized, assaulted, killed. Those are some of the conditions that we say are indicative of a shrinking space. But also over and above the, the physical threats, there's also restrictions imposed in how civil society operates, limiting the space of operation in terms of who funds civil society, how are they registered, changing NPO bills, all of those things, but also assembly and how we are organizing ourselves as civil society, whether we are allowed to challenge government through public demonstrations. And we do, if we do have public demonstrations, there is no physical threat or denying permission or notices to much. And if all of those things are not allowed, are not enabled, that is a complete trunk curtailed right of civil society to participate. But even with, uh, with that, in South Africa, and I'll show this and demonstrate this through the two, the, the two case studies, shrinking civic space is not something experienced in the same way. Civil society, are, civil society organizations are different. Communities are different. Therefore, it cannot be that this will be experienced in the same way. There are certain groups that are still enjoying the privilege of being closer to power, meaning government, that they might not be experiencing shrinking civic space in the same way as other civil society organizations. So the shifts are not experienced in the same way by young people, by women, by people who are living in rural areas, but because there are particular challenges and layers of oppression and exclusions that those groups fundamentally are already ex ex experiencing over and above what we are seeing at the national level, already in the ways in which we are socializing participation or normalizing normative uh, participation of, of young people and women, we're already at the bottom of the ladder. So shrinking civic space will be definitely felt more for those groups who are already feeling excluded and oppressed, didn't have the voice to participate. And here I'm indicating, again, when I speak about the two case studies, keep that in mind, in how the, the, the question was answered, whether civil, civil, civic space is shrinking in South Africa, with the difference between social uh, uh, um, section 27 and equal education are very unique. And you will, in a way, you can sense the underlying differences because of the nature of their constituencies and the nature of the organization. So some of the characteristics that we look at vary and they're contextual. That's why I'm raising this urban-rural divide the women and the young people, because it will vary how it will shrink for youth spaces than for women in rural areas or for people who live in rural areas. And the laws and policies and practices are not going to be felt the same way. And it might not be physical intimidation, it might be, it might be symptoms of intimidation, but not exactly that something tangible that you can touch. And I'll share a bit more there from, the, from the data. 
but also it's as as we said that it's also about restricting civil society ability to participate and of course this the the, the space is not homogeneous it's not experienced in the same so the, i've already spoken about the four case studies i used key informants interviews four focus groups and four observations of the four um, case studies. There wasn't a, a number uh, linked to each of the, for example, I didn't go out there saying, I'm going to interview uh, 10 people at, at Equal Education. If Equal Education preferred to do more informant, key informant interviews, I was led by the case study to say, it would be better to speak to our community organizers as a focus group rather than as individuals, and the provincial and national uh, organizers, they preferred key informant interviews. So there was differences in the in the approaches depending on what the, the case studies preferred. Because one of the things that we really wanted with this study was that we needed it to be at least participatory in, in allowing people to express themselves in the way that they feel comfortable with. Of course, COVID didn't allow uh, absolutely didn't allow that we could do face-to-face uh, -face conversations. There were some interviews that were done face-to-face, -face, but a lot of them were done virtually. But all the case study observations, except for Section 27, were all face-to-face. -face. Section 27 webinar was online. So the first case study is equal education. As I said, they have a, food, five, a footprint in sorry five provinces. Sorry to interrupt, Vithaya. It seems as if... The slides are not moving on my side. Oh, really? Yes. I don't know yes. if it's, it's the same and now? for everyone. No, they are not. I don't know. Andres, are they moving um, on your side? <laughs> I think you need to st stop and reach select again. Slide. Select slideshow slide. on the yeah. top where the tabs are. Select slideshow and then just click as you move through the slides. Yeah, because you've stop. got it in the wrong view. Oh. So you see where it says slide? There we go. Slideshow. Mm -hmm. You are you still sharing? You're not sharing. Sharing okay. now. There but wait. Yeah. Now that, that should be fine. Just move yes. through. Are you sure? Because I didn't click slideshow. Yeah, we can see well, the slides now. You can see the slides. See the slides. Okay. Can you see okay. now if so, I change the slide? Yes. yes. Perfect. Okay, I'm moving. Yes, perfect. All right, thank you so thank much. You. Thanks, Alice. So they have a footprint in five provinces. They mostly work with schools, governing bodies, provincial uh, departments, national departments. They work with teacher unions, with youth movements, but also have they themselves a youth movement. And their main focus is improving basic education and inclusive education. So their focus is very defined. It's an education space, which obviously then means that there are stakeholders around the education sector. And they are led by young people who are in and outside of school, but also parents of young people, school governing bodies. And this is important to note as we are going to share some of the indications of the shifting civic space for equal education because their stakeholders are very, and they too are experiencing similar um, intimidations because of association with equal education. So I'm just highlighting the, those stakeholders so that you're not surprised immediately when I talk about the SGB, that you know what I'm talking about. So uh, for Section 27 is a human rights organization. In terms of footprint presence on the ground, they work in Kauteng, Eastern Cape Limpopo, but their work has impact uh, nationally. They take up any litigation case across provinces, the focus is use of law, advocacy, legal literacy, research, and community mobilization. They work a lot with other movements uh, on the ground who are working on the intersection between HIV and health and, and right to basic education. Fundamentally, they are grounded and guided by the Constitution, but looking at it from a systematic change and accountability to ensure dignity and equality for everyone. Again, the intersection here is right to is the right to educate basic education with equal education, but they are very different. They are an NGO, not a social movement. So key findings. One um, it, that I will share on the, in the following slides is that there is an answer that came from the two case studies whether 
South African civic space is shrinking. There also, there are indications of administrative legal instruments that are shifting. There's informal, there's a big number of themes that emerged from indications of informal instruments of shifting civic space. And this is, for me, Shona, something that needs to continue to be explored because it's not, it's not formal. You can't track it by indicators. You can't see it, but it is felt by comrades. So because it's not saying organizations should not register, but the way in which they are suffocated to in practice almost will kill them. So and some of those informal ways of shifting space are, are not often easy to capture. Um, and it's it's not very easy because you are not looking at the just the permit. You are also looking at what the presence of the police or how the police speak to you and how are you being received and misunderstood, gaslighted, and all of those things. And then some indications from the studies in the study in terms of drivers of that shifting space. And there was a big introspection from these two case studies about their capability or incapacity to, to work within this environment. And that environment also shrinking civic so civil society within itself. And some of the challenges that they are experiencing, some of them are internal, some of them are external. So the first thing is, is South African civic space shrinking? There was no indication of shrink as a word, but there was shift, there was openness, partial open, partially closed or closing. But what is interesting in the findings is that I, when I grouped the responses by national, provincial, or local, it, for equal education, the space is shifting at national level, but for Section 27, it remains open. Almost most of the, so, 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 or of the Section 27 uh, key informants did not indicate any closing space at national compared to, 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 such, to equal education. But provincial, both because that's where the implementation for basic education infrastructure norms and standards are being implemented. That's where the biggest challenge is for both organizations. For Section 27 and for EE, they are able to influence and monitor implementation, but they sometimes feel that there is, there's pushback in their participation. They are sometimes intimidated, but they're still feeling like they are being heard in one way or another. Locally, for Section 27, they felt that they, at local level, it's partially closing. It's not closed yet. They are still influencing. Whereas for EE, most of the equal education district organizers in Gauteng, in Eastern Cape, said the same thing, that they feel that the space is closing down in, in, at local level. And there are examples that they're using in terms of the principals, the schools, the police, that came up in the in the in the in the themes in terms of how what are the examples that they can give me. So here is one example of again that the shrinking civic space or shifting civic space is not experienced in the same way. Even at in one country, you will find that it's experienced differently across the levels of participation. National it will be different than province. Province will be different than local. Where we are concerned, maybe. As, as, as the Center for Civil Society is not just to look at national, but to look at where the most majority of the poor whose hopes only rely on civil society at local level, in townships, in villages, when the space is closing down there, who and what is the disconnect between the local activists and the national activists whose mandate and interest are being represented in the spaces where activists are participating in open spaces if the space is closed down, down there. Are we going to eventually have no ground swell of mass movements on the ground if the space there is closing down? Again, that's just a question. It's not something that I have found or uh, explored further. The other is, sorry for the busy slide, the other pieces, formal instruments that are used to shift the space the biggest one that came out, I think, across except for Section 27, is the right to protest continues to be a problem. And the use of the permit or much permit or notice 
being denied without reasons given to activists was, was very common in, in amongst most of the interviews I did at Equal Education. But over and above the permit being denied, no explanation, they complain if if you do get a permit. Dad, what's going on? Oh, shit. Sorry? Oh. So if you do get a permit, the memorandum will be accepted, but you will hear nothing after that. If you are given a permit or notice is granted, often equal education now has to bring private security in the match. And the whole list of things and examples that equal education is now subjected to, but it's not by law. By law, the act is very clear. Once you serve a notice, you are supposed to be given a, 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 a reason why you are being denied. It must be a valid reason. When you've submitted a memorandum, you will get a response, either acknowledgement of receipt, or you can follow up with an email that they will say we've received the email and we can invite you to a meeting. The presence of the private security raises unique concerns and challenges. The cost of bringing private security in a match, again, will we'll show these inequalities within organizations that why is it for equal education, a mass movement organization has to bring private security for their match, whereas it's not the same for another. And who's paying for private security? But private security also does not follow you home. It can only follow you in the match, but it will not follow every activist and every leader of social of equal education to home where some of the vulnerability will occur. The other is intimidation personally to the activists, to the leaders. For example, equal, equal education said they've experienced a sense of isolation and sometimes get strange calls from people who are saying to them, and particularly this was a quote directly from one of the leaders, and I did not want to name the leader, who said the quote, someone said in the call, we know where you live. The connection between that private security I've just spoken about in the match and not following you at home, already that intimidation personally means that the person is not safe outside of the match space. And also for, again, for equal education, and this is for the focus group, which is more the local activists who are feeling highly at risk. One time they questioned a community leader about corruption and one of the, the activists was held at gunpoint by one of the one of the, the leaders that they were they were questioning and holding accountable. So intimidation is definitely something that equal education has experienced and have shared uh, as part of this. And the differentiated approaches between equal education, how they're experiencing it, is very interesting and unique that the direct, the direct intimidation to equal education and those who are associated to equal education seems to be very particular to equal education, whereas for section 27 in right, you will that for section 27 is mostly for those who are associated with section 27, less of direct intimidation to, to section 27 leaders or activists. So, and here is an, an, uh, some of the examples I'm going to talk about this for social for section 27, the fact that the, the intimidation occurs to those who report to section 27, to those who work with section 27, which is different from equal, equal education, it's across the board. It's to the activists, to those that they work with. And in this slide, I am demonstrating those informal instruments being used in the, to shift the civic space. One labeling and stigmatizing and excluding um, particularly people in meetings or calling them names, labeling people. For example, there's one activist in Limpopo from Section 27 who said because he's an activist, uh, he is an active member of the ANC, he was called a puppet of white people and selling out on the ANC, to the ANC. Another one is for me, it's borderline undertone sexism, calling a leader of equal education, a, you are now back, girl, girl and naughty in the same sentence, that's how she phrased it, almost means that she's not seen as a leader, 
she's seen as a child who's misbehaving for holding government accountable. And in a way, putting her down in her place of being subservient or less important or powerful than those who are calling her girl and being naughty. The other example is the example of Section 27 in Mpopo again, where the state failed to build new schools mm -hmm. and the community then started building up shacks to accommodate their, their kids. And, and and rebuilding the school which with a with a corrugated iron sheets. And the, the parents who did that took government to court. The pressure from the district, the Department of Education manager to the parents led to parents withdrawing the case. So they didn't say anything to equal education of section 27, they challenge directly the parents up outside of them being protected by the name of civil society. Another example is in Eastern Cape, where, for example, the school principal who works with equal education was interrogated by the premier about the presence of equal education activists which are which are activists in that school. They are not being shipped from outside to inside. They are working and organizing in that school. And the principal was put under pressure. And as a result, the, the principal had to go and report to Nongedo that, for example, in equal education, that your presence in the school is causing too much problems for me. In a way, because of their association with, with, with equal education, then the, the space in that school is closing down. The other is delegitimizing uh, young people's voices. Ageism came up as a big issue. Sorry, are you speaking? Akuma. Oh, sorry, I thought someone- You can, you can continue, Fuisaya. Uh, ageism is something that came out very strongly in the, in the, in the, in the Equal Education Congress, who are saying, because we are young, we, we are treated as children who don't know what we are saying and doing. We are not listened to, we are silenced, we are disregarded, our voice is not seen as legitimate. There was a big issue around ageism that came up in a negative way using young people's age. In some, in some cases, the structure and the, 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 the outlook of a young person who comes to a school was used, come back, with an adult. There was, there's a quote where they went to a police station to report the case of abuse of their child. Again, indicating that the police were not going to be held accountable by a child. Not because the, the issue was illegitimate because of the person who's holding them accountable being a young person. So these are what I call informal instruments that you can't track them to an act, to a bill, but they are felt and they instill fear and they are closing down spaces where civil society and communities are organizing their voices and organizing other voices by closing those spaces. That too is showing shifts in civic space. Is that unique to this period? I don't think so. I think that is always present. It's just that it's not captured as a big uh, physical intimidation, people being killed in the case of Bazooka. But this can deter a person or an activist from participating because what is the point if you are going to be dismissed? So some of the drivers that we were highlighted is one, it almost feels like the civil society feels like they are, they are being managed in how they must influence. There's also feeling like they because they are receiving less funding, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about the funding, examples that I, we have received uh, themes on. There's a convergence of civil society feeling, you know, less capable at the same time of a declining civil society funding. And that too, that convergence is reinforcing civil society, strengthening itself in a very difficult time when the civic space is shifting. It's not, they don't have enough resources to counter the ships or strengthen themselves or develop new ways of working. For example, if they need to hire a private security, where is the funding going to come from for them to still continue to be, to organize protests 
without fear of being picked up from the protest. Also, the, within civil society, clash of values because of this unequal resource scarcity and people having access to power, those who have access to power feel more protected than those who do not have access to power. There's also shifts of power from political actors who want more of that power away from civil society. So all of that could also be something that could be explored further. Is there something unique about this period that's causing this shift? But one of the uh, Section 27 uh, activist interviews said, we, we should not see civic space as a static process. As, I mean, civic space is a static process. It will always be continuously a power struggle. And if we see it as a power struggle, we should always also think about ways in which we can counter those factors that are shifting civic, civic space. Or almost in a way, let's anticipate that it's going to happen. And when it does happen, build our capability to evolve and be agile to those problems of the day or challenges of the day. So here is just an observation that I did at uh, Equal Education when they were launching uh, their monitoring report on overcrowding, which is part and parcel of their work to, to monitor uh, the norms and standards. The event had planned to have a march. They did not get a approval of the march notice. There was no presence of the National Department of Education to receive the report and the grievances of young people expressing their conditions in schools. And that again is, is one, it's an example that really shows what I've, what they have told me that they, there seems to be something going on in their relationship with the national government. And the observation that was very clear through this example was, is the lack of presence of national department because this was held in Gauteng. There was easy access to government to come, even a provincial government representative to come and receive the report. Then for equal for section twenty seven, interestingly, it it was it was a webinar to launch a health reform report that was looking at um, what are some of the discourses and debates around national health insurance in South Africa, and where do they agree and disagree. There was a full presence of a a panel up to the national government to the best academics um, available on the issue of health, and they were on the webinar. And I, I still ask myself, what is it with this differentiated, uh, ex not expression, but experiences of civic space between these two? Um, is it because the other is, is a social movement? Is it this one because it's an NGO? Is it because this one is made up of lawyers and lawyers can sue the state and have sued the state, therefore the state is a little bit scared? compared to a social movement of poor people, young people who do not have resources. There are many things one could deduce from all of this and how the experiences is different, but it could also be the, the over two decades of Section 27 engagement with National Department of Health, the relationship is solid and strong, but one would assume if there's shrinking civic space or shift in civic space nationally, it should be felt in different ways across government, not just to certain groups, but it we could, we, maybe I'm wrong. So the last slide is civic capacity, which is something that civil society had expressed that they too are worried about themselves. They are worried about repositioning themselves and their relevance in current politics in South Africa. The funding is leading to limited solidarity because they are competing for resources. Sometimes the young people felt that the civil society space is not interesting. It's not, it's, it, it, there's no imagination. It's not creative. It's not disruptive, almost predictable and boring. Maybe that's why the, the, one of the activists uh, expressed that we are suffering, civil society is suffering from normality syndrome. We've normalized performing our pain and our struggle and government has normalized that. So it's not shifting government. It's not moving government's heart that civil society continues to be protesting in the same way 
in the uninteresting, non-creative, non-disruptive way because they are predictable and they know how to manage them. That's why they ignore these memorandums. So those were some of the examples of what so they felt that they too need to do work on themselves to get themselves ready and capable to challenge this shifting space in civil society, in, in, in civic space, but also to challenge their position in society by strengthening, them, strengthening themselves. So I'm going to pause there and take uh, some questions. Thank you. Thank you for you, Sega. Uh, this is an excellent presentation and um, these are excellent results, I must say. Um, I think uh, you, you, you also pose, you know, serious, uh, maybe follow up uh, questions. Uh, if maybe we are to uh, maybe do a second round of the research. Um, let me just comment before I just open the floor. I really interested in how you, you know, unpack, you know, the issue of uh, failing to tra track, you know, the. The, the the shrinking of the civic space, especially uh, when it is sometimes felt, you say it in an informal way. And I I was also, you know, uh, sort of interested in how you, you know, conceptualize or theorize, you know, the different uh, experiences of uh, you know the shrinking civic space uh, within the organization and uh, in terms of administratively, that is uh, the national, uh, provincial, and local. Mm -hmm. And I I I I guess I I also want to pose a question there, maybe why you think maybe the local uh, activists uh, they feel you know that uh, the space the space is shrinking as compared to maybe those that are in the national office. Um, let me just open, yeah, Sean, I see your hand. Um, you can go in and also ask some questions. Uh, that's, that was a brilliant uh, presentation, we say. Uh, I think uh, uh, you are on to something, you know, a, a brilliant paper can come out of this. Uh, thank, thank you so much, we say. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, for you, Seka, that I echo that. That was a, a really beautiful presentation. I think that you you captured the main points and you did that so beautifully in forty five minutes. So um, well done. I just I just have to say before I comment on the thing, I I just can't I can't convey to you how proud I am of you. I I think you're incredible in so many ways, and I've known you since twenty thirteen, and I've been privileged to know you, and I, I I just I just am so incredibly proud of you and the things that you do and the frames that you use to interpret things and how important the civil society in the civic space is to you. So my question is, um, do you think it would be more useful because it, it seems that it's not entirely ac accurate to use this term shrinking spaces of civil society. Um, you know, we I think we already had critique of that at the research proposal stage. Do you think it might be more useful to say something like, civil society shifting tactics around these sorts of challenges. So we, at the moment, we're saying that the, the civil society space is shifting, but mm. is it not movements and civics, if you want to call it that, I've been doing some reading, Ketla Shubana's work on the civics of the 1980s, and it, would it not be more, more useful and more accurate to say that it's the civics um, who are shifting tactics and strategies around these spaces that are changing, something like that, would that be more accurate? Um, mm. I also take this opportunity to apologize. I have to leave at five o'clock, so I, but I mean, I will leave you guys to carry on with your discussions. Buiseka, thank you. Mm. Thank you very much for this really amazing seminar. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Shona, and again for the questions. Let me start by, by Shona. So, one of the challenges that I am struggling with to shrink something, literally, it's you, you. It's not closing it, but you're making it smaller. If if it's made smaller, really fundamentally, is South African civic space smaller? No, I did not find any results that says overall national 
civil society shrinking. It could be civil, civic spaces shrinking. It could be that maybe the question we asked needs to be further explained in the sense that so now that we now know that there is shifting ways in which civil society is engaging. This in this is also telling us where things where the shifting context within which civil society is operating in. How are they shifting in engaging? But I also think that. We, we now have answered the question that civil society is not shrinking, civic space is not shrinking, but it has changed. The context has changed. The context has changed at different levels for different reasons, which we didn't explore too much. So the shift for me was very clear. The shrink was not clear because there is no change in legislation, no act. Even the NPO bill was just a threat yet not to be implemented. So there's nothing tangible that I could find that says this, the space has shrunk, but the shifts are clear. But even within the shifts, I think you're right. Civil society is adapting to the shifts in one way or another, but I'm not sure if it's significant enough for us to, I don't know, maybe if we look at a different sector and we look at some of these case studies, whether they can tell us anything about how. Equal education for me, the interesting thing about the presence of private security was a shift in how they are adapting to the context, meaning we are going to protest, but we're going to protest protecting ourselves compared to others who are still continuously protesting without private security, with, which is the case of um, as a, uh, social justice coalition in the other presentations. So can the question you're asking then, can, can shrinking lead to shift? No. I think shift can lead to shrink. If we continue on the downward spiral of shifting and closing and partially open, we definitely are going towards a shrinking civic space. If we don't, if civil society does not come back, build its capability to defend, to readapt, to reimagine ways of contesting this, the context that is closing and shifting, I don't think we will end up with shrinking. Shrinking is not a linear line that we're going to start here and we're going to end there. I think we are big, we are at the beginnings in one or one way or another for certain sectors. We are at the beginning of towards shrinking, but we are we, we are not yet at shrinking, and shrinking is not our starting point. Shifting is possibly for me the the thing that came forward. So then the question about about uh, tracking the informal shifts. So. Then what I did is, I, I, for me, I, I thought of a conceptual framework more than a theoretical framework. And hopefully one day I will land with a theoretical framework. Because when I looked at the symptoms, the symptoms of the conditions, then I used that to develop the conceptual framework where I came up with this discursive means or the impact, for example, the what could pot potentially be changes in these conditions in freedom and safety, potentially that could curtail civil society function. The attacks on individuals at a very soft level, such as stigma, because stigma is not seen as something like the police brutally killing you, but the labeling, the, the stigma itself can, can stop you from participating, from going to a march or leading an organization, or even cease to exist as an organization because you feel the targeting to this particular group because you are lab labeled as antagonistic. I'm sure you found similar things with group action campaign, that that immediately, that stigma, when civil society walks in the room, they are already labeled in a particular way that people are not hearing their views and contributions in that policy with the same ear or the same way. The other piece on labeling that is highly problematic, when you label an individual, that label doesn't only stick to you, the person who directed to, but it also stick to legitimizing to others that you are the problem, you are the pimpy, you are the sellout, 
you are making it legitimate for others to believe that you are misbehaving. And because you are misbehaving, next time when you are not invited and others should not invite you because you behave in this, but because this, this discursive is not just fed, this narrative about you is not just fed in that meeting, it is shared publicly to shame and name you publicly to legitimize and delegitimize your voice and your contribution, and therefore making other people believe that this label is legitimately belonging to you and that organization, and therefore shouldn't be invited in meetings. Then you will be ex excluded. You will be isolated in, in, in spaces no one wants to engage with. So that's the first thing in how I thought about these informal ways of threats that we often don't capture that can also disempower people's voices, particularly young people who are new in this space, who are still gaining trust in their power to participate by immediately labeling them and stigmatizing them. The intent is for them to be excluded, potentially not to function, potentially not to be in that space. The other, the other strategy, the intimidation of those associated with you it's another form of stigma. It's an associated stigma. If these schools and these governing bodies and these parents didn't work with equal education in Section 27, they will be safely safe in accepting that we, the school, the government doesn't have money to build a new school, therefore accept the norm. Because equal education comes and brings the law and the understanding that you can hold government accountable and organizes that community, and seen as an, as an organization that's causing problems, those who are associated with them to receive another form of intimidation because they are not the only ones who are also, not equal education only is going to receive that intimidation. It's also those who are instituting the, 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 the demands of the organization, meaning you must reject a, a, a disbanding or not lack of building schools. And therefore by the parents believing that they have a right to question, they have a right to hold government accountable. Government will intimidate them too by their association with a troublemaking organization that's already labeled and, and already stigmatized as a problematic organization, sometimes to the extent of others not wanting to wear the t-shirt, others not wanting to be associated, go to matches, participate, or even want their children to join or young people to join the, those movements. So, that's how I, I framed it conceptually. And for me, I, 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 don't, I don't really like going to theoretical frameworks without a conceptual framework because I just feel the themes are speaking for themselves. Now I'm trying to make sense, what is the relationship with the bigger themes? Is there something called informal strategies um, in, in shifting civic space? And with this study, I think they are. How we are linking them up to bigger theories is still for me working progress because they don't fit with the, with the dominant views of shrinking civic space in the sense that we are not repressing freedom and assembly, but we will make you not want to go to the march. We will intimidate you with the presence of the police, but we will not beat you. We will not issue you with a memorandum, we issue you with a permit to, to march. With, we're just not gonna give you a reason and we're just going to deny it. That for me is, you can't say, you can't sue government on an informal condition that they are imposing to you because they will tell you it is your interpretation. For them, they were very clear. They were just telling you they don't agree with this and but the way in which they are doing it is repressive. Thank you for you, Sega. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, we start uh, with the concepts and then we move uh, to, you know, the, the, the theories. So do we have anyone with a question or wants to engage with Vui Sega? I think there they, they, has been literature written on, you know, the, the practice of soft power. I think uh, Foucault has written mm, something mm. on it. Uh, you don't feel like you're being, you are oppressed, but you know, they will yeah, employ yeah. Uh, soft technologies of, of power, you know, mm. such as 
uh, labeling, mm -hmm. um, such as, you know, excluding someone, uh, you know, uh, through constructing them as, 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 you know, trouble, as being naughty, mm -hmm. as, as being a nonsense and, and all of those. So I, I, I truly agree with you, uh, Fuise. Then there is Achuma. Am I saying your name right? Good evening. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Akuma. Uh -huh. oh, Akuma. Akuma. Akuma, yes. I was an Eastern Pakistan. Oh, okay. I'm a police abafu. Yes. Thank you. Um, good evening, ma'am. Thank you for your presentation. Um, the question I have is: Would you say that there are findings which prove that um the shifting of civic spaces has played an influence on gender roles? Mm -hmm. hmm. We say. Uh, hmm. That's a very interesting question because that was a subset of the of my research, uh, which I'm working on a paper on whether there is any gendered, are there any shifting gendered um, civic spaces? And Sonke gender justice and some parts of equal education give us some results on this. Yes, there is an impact on shifting civic space, on gender, in this case, talking about gender in the diversity, not just women and girls, but women and girls are included in how this shifting civic space further marginalizes women and girls in participating in political lives, including civil society. There's also evidence for those organizations who work with queer communities, in this case, LGBTQI, sex workers, are further on the bottom of, of the ladder in terms of being considered important players in this space and their space has shifted. In South Africa, for, from, the, from Songa Gender Justice case study, which I will share in, I think in two weeks time, there is no indication of shrinking because the constitution is very clear on equality. But society and participation at local levels, not always governed by the constitution, is governed by people's law. And people's law is how people exclude others, stigmatize others, treat others differently, which is the soft power piece that Dan is talking about, which I think it's the interpretation of what people say we will not tap into law, but we're going to treat you differently. And in not treating differently, we want you to eventually for you to exclude yourself from participation. But also the way in which civic space is structured also follows the, the, the norms of patriarchy, the norms of society, of the unequal hierarchy, where those who have time, who don't have the burden of care, who have money, um, what are the reasons? You have a car, there are many things. Your social status will have more secure civic space compared to women. Women have to go to meetings with children. That already will impede on their ability to run if the police is chasing them. Or girls, in some cases, might be experiencing corrective rape for how they participated in the meeting or will be ridiculed or sexist or misogynist tendencies will emerge. In the case, as I shared with you, Nongadjo's case, for example, in equal education, where equal education leaders are treated as children and who are being naughty. That is a gendered framing of how are, are, are women who are leading movements being, or movements led by women are experiencing this shifting space. And I will I'll I'll say more on this piece when I'm sharing the the Songa gender justice piece because I think it's very different from other from others. Where there are women leading, it's different. Where there are key populations in this case, 
uh, LGBTQI communities because of what we're seeing in the globe, we, the influence in society and the impact, the negative impact in society in how certain groups and of populations in society are being treated very different. So again, it's all about what is hanging below the, the formal shrinking space is not easily understood because it's all convoluted with many other factors. It's not just because of the shrinking space, because of systems of oppression already had put these roles that are gendered at the bottom, and those people who are in those positions being put in those boxes are at the bottom. They will further be marginalized if a space is shrinking. They will not have a voice. Thank you, Vyusega. This is such an interesting uh, discussion. Is there anyone? I think we are way overboard now with 11 minutes. Uh, I just want to respect your time, Vyusega, so that I won't take much of your time. Andres, uh, if there are no any other questions, um, maybe we can just uh, end here. Avui Sega, I think it's an interesting, I think if you write a paper, it will shift, you know, the way, because I've seen a lot of, of papers on shrinking space and Vu Sega Noya also, you know, sort of uh, said maybe the space uh, is not... Uh, really shrinking. Maybe the space was just like that, you know, post apartheid mm. South Africa. Maybe, the, mm. you know, it's black people, maybe we're not, we're never treated as, you know, uh, mm. you know, uh, people with full uh, citizen rights. So we cannot talk of something that we never, ever had, you know, mm. since 1652. So it's something that uh, you are really, you know, is striking a chord here, here when I listen to you. And uh, on the issue of um, you know women uh, activists treated being treated as uh, children, yeah, there's, mm. yeah, there's uh, who are rights. Uh, she also writes on issues on on power and you know how black like, people are treated in you know in Britain, especially the professional space, uh, and across Europe, how you know black people are treated as kids. Mm. Uh, I think you, I will just send you the the the, the 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 book so that you can also maybe look at that session and maybe if you are writing the paper you can refer to her work. I I I thank you so much, Vuisega, for this uh, 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 for this uh, seminar. I think it was conceptually, theoretically, I think it was so stimulating. So. Over to you, Andres. Yeah, from my side, thank you very much, Visega, for making the time uh, to come speak to us. I look forward to your uh, next uh, seminar, especially when it comes to gender dynamics, because I'm yes. very intrigued by that, uh, coming from a male perspective, that how do you view those dynamics and how do you make the spaces much better for women? Mm -hmm. So really looking forward to it. I'll try and get people that are working in the space as well so that we can have much more engagement on this. But thanks for the time that you've made and for the interesting seminar that you did today. No, thank you. Thank you, everybody, especially those who participated. And I think all of us, let's just keep being aware when we are seeing the shifts, documenting them. And I am also sometimes, as, as Dan has said, that he, sometimes it's very difficult for in the space of, of, of gender, to see whether they are shifting or not, because it's been always like this. What is shifting now? It's the narrative uh, globally, but it doesn't mean that for certain groups, it has not been this way. And I think also documenting that using these opportunities through this, this, research, this research, particularly if there is a way to do a follow-up to see whether this is just the same for certain groups and it's always been the same. And now we're hyper, alert and vigilant because it affects certain groups and name that uh, as it is. Um, so I'm looking forward to more and more conversations. All right. Thank you, Sega. I've sent Bye. you the reading. I've sent Thank you the reading. Okay. Thank you. Bye.